you to the audience so now i welcome all the participants and uh, professor shantanu mahapatra to this session so thank you very much sir for uh, joining our request for joining our nanodev 2021 so deliver a talk on uh, non volatile resistive memories based of uh, two dimensional materials thank you very much sir so professor shantanu mahapatra received his be from jadavpur university in the field of electronics and telecommunication engineering and uh, in 2000 in 1999 amtech from uh, uh, iit kanpur in 2001 then phd from swiss federal institute of technology lausanne in 2005 for his phd dissertation he worked on the modeling of single electron transistor and its co simulation and co design with cmos he joined isc bangalore in the department of electronic science systems engineering formerly known as cedt as an assistant professor in 2005 he was promoted to full professor in 2015 he has founded nano scale device research lab in 2006 where his research team is engaged in modeling of carrier transports in nano materials at circuit device and atomistic level his research interests include two dimensional channel transistors energy efficient electronic switches and energy storage at nano scale he has been the author of book hybrid cmos single electron transistor device and circuit design he has received many awards including ibm faculty award in 2007 Microsoft Research India Outstanding Faculty Award in 2007 and Associateship of Indian Academy of Sciences in 2009 He is also the recipient of Ramanna Fellowship from 2012 to 2015 in the area of electrical sciences from DST Government of India for his contribution in compact modeling He is has been involved in various research projects funded by dst isro csir ibm he is a senior member of ieee and editor of sadhana he is also an adjunct faculty at iit allahabad so now i request you sir to deliver talks over to you sir thank you varun thank you very much for the introduction and uh, yeah good uh, afternoon right yeah good afternoon everybody uh, so last year also i gave a talk during this pandemic uh, so today i will talk about uh, this new area the emerging area in general uh, which we call in memory computing and the technology required for this in memory computing that is uh, non volatile resistive memory devices and especially when you make this device using this emerging material 2d material so this is a emerging area and hot area and uh, it is a very interesting area in that sense that uh, it has everything starts from materials then device then uh, circuit then finally the architecture and um, it is a change in paradigm the way we do computing it is a alternative computing technique and uh, so every um, starting from material to at the end architecture all of this each component is very very active uh, but as you know in india it is always you know to uh, your technologically backward and so not significant work uh maybe discreetly few people are doing here and there but uh, the way the work is going on in west uh, or in far east we are nowhere close to that in this particular domain of in memory computing uh, so i work in device area as you know and recently uh, that is uh, some insight a theoretical insight to non volatile uh, resistive memory which is built on this 2d material uh, but 
I will try to give a very broad overview of this particular topic in memory computing and the registry memory and spend a lot of time to give this overview than, you know, talking about uh, our work, which could be very technical. Okay, so we start. Fine. Okay, so we start with, um, you know, prologue Horn Newman architecture and the bottleneck and what is really in memory computing how and how the resistive memory is related to it okay so we all know most of you probably know who has kind of electrical engineering background that uh, the computers all the computers the laptops that presently i am using or you are using uh, even the computer server uh, they are built upon this von Neumann architecture. So what does it mean that, you know, in computer, uh, there is two major unit. One is the CPU, that is the processing unit, which does all the calculation. Um, and then you have the memory unit, or you say the RAM, the DRAM mainly, okay. And uh, so you store the information in memory and then you bring this information inside the CPU. Uh, let me just switch. Okay, so it is our RAM, okay, that you purchase from the market. In If you open a computer, you'll see there are separate slot for this RAM. Okay, they are DRAM mainly. And then you, this is the processor. Okay, they are completely two separate units and they are connected by the bus it is a road okay, information uh, road okay. uh, so information travel through this bus okay. so this is the basic von neumann architecture and from the beginning computer whatever maybe we have moved to old days uh, uh, this pc to very modern uh, this kind of laptop nowadays uh, but this is the Core architecture which remains same okay and uh, so the bottleneck of this structure is this pathway okay the bus or the road okay on which the information travel between this okay uh, because it has a throughput okay critical throughput and we cannot increase it if the data transfer limit so the overall uh, uh the processing speed depends on this data transfer limit of this bus okay so now why there is so much uh, hue and cry about this von Neumann architecture because we have been using it for a long long time okay so why today why people are talking about it okay so here the main thing you can see that the memory and the computation these two units they are physically separate Okay. and they are connected by bus. So it is uh, nowadays, um, they are, this problem was identified long time before, but still we are managing it, managing using different technique, like probably, you know, we also have a small memory unit within the CPU that is called cache memory. Okay, so we can play with this cache memory design and somehow can manage, okay, although it is a bottleneck. Okay. So nowadays there is a lot of talks and we talk about von Neumann bottleneck, et cetera, okay, because of the rise of AI, okay. So nowadays AI and machine learning, those type of algorithm are becoming very important. We are using it everywhere. And uh, so it is found that this type of algorithm is not really suitable um to execute this type of architecture von Neumann architecture is not very suitable for executing this deep learning algorithm okay why so here so i have drawn a basic structure of a neuron all of you probably know so it is a neuron so it has several input and one output that is the synapse and uh, then uh, you know that this is called the ann artificial neural network model basic model so you have weights associated with this each of this input so wi 
and finally the output it is the summation of the product of this wi and hj okay and here you have some activation function okay so we have a threshold value so um, when the threshold uh, when the summation is lower than this threshold the neuron will not fire but when it is um, uh, more than this threshold it will fire okay so this is the basic model of a neuron then here you get a deep neural network you have many many neurons and depending on types of neural network you are connected to each other and these are the front layer and it is the end layer and in between you have multiple hidden layer okay more the hidden layer it can uh, handle more complex tasks and so we come to this problem of the computation okay this is so called vector matrix multiplication problem so look at this thing so wj and xj so these are actually vectors okay or matrix so matrix is vector is one dimensional matrix so it's just a single column so this is a matrix and this is a matrix so weights and the inputs they are actually stored in memory and just to do this you know calculation product you bring it to the, comp the cpu and do the calculation okay then you do many calculation then you add it okay so you do it only once okay generally but for that you have to store this thing in memory and you have to bring it back bring it inside cpu do the calculation and then send it back okay and this we are doing for this particular type of deep learning uh, algorithm many times several times and so that creates a bottleneck so this problem was there earlier also but for this particular application this route is becoming very very busy and it is becoming the bottleneck okay so now uh, so people are looking for another type of paradigm of computation another type of architecture that is beyond von neumann architecture so which says that if it is possible you can embed memory inside the cpu or in other way you embed cpu within this memory and do the computation with this memory uh, that is called the in memory computation okay in other way also you can think that um, you know our human brain which is also a computer so again talking about neuron etc see in human brain again you will see there is no separate unit for you know the processing and storing the information they are embedded so in that way this memory computing uh, give the notion of this neuromorphic computing or why then embedded um, in memory computing is uh, very much required for all of this neuromorphic computation and the application okay so this is the basic idea okay now so in a in memory computing system basically it is you are doing within i mean cpu and the memory unit they are not separable okay so now um, data stored and processed they are simultaneously high speed energy efficient and used very much in neuromorphic computing so this is the block diagram but the realization it is like this this is the new architecture that is the crossbar uh, it is called crossbar architecture so it is heavily dense you know stackable so you these are the information line and here you have something called mem register or resistive memory it is so far i will explain what it is it is a two terminal device it is basically a register okay but in a normal register if you see what it is it is the ohm's law it varies the ohm's law it is v and i so you have a linear response okay it is a continuous iv characteristics but here it will not have a continuous iv characteristics so basically it will have different state okay that is the state of memory star so the resistance will have a i would say quantized i don't want to use this logic okay it will have several level of resistance okay so lowest level we can say it is zero and the highest level it is the one okay so here 
at the junction of these two, you know, these are bars, you can say, or red line, right line, and here, so the crossbar, each of this, um, uh, you know, the joining point of this crossbar here, this, this blue, okay, these are this registry memory also, which is commonly known as mem register, okay. And so you can understand that if you look at this architecture, it itself looks like a matrix, okay? So that's why this kind of architecture, it is very natural for this kind of neural network, okay? Because here you are doing the vector multi matrix multiplication because it itself is a matrix, okay? Now, and here a few things, um, uh, see, I again come to our conventional memory, which is a DRAM, okay. Uh, probably you know the basic architecture of DRAM, so we call it 1T, 1C, okay. So one transistor, which controls the data flow and actually you have one capacitor, okay. So this we call, you know, our regular, uh, circuitry, electronic circuitry, it works on charge. So whatever we use, we call it, it is the charge based logic. Okay. So, uh, but you see, we cannot directly measure the charge. Okay. To measure the charge, uh, we have to convert it in voltage. Okay. So that's where we require a capacitor. So you store the charge in a capacitor and then you measure the voltage. But you have studied that if you would like to store, I mean, if you would like to charge a capacitor to certain voltage, say VDD, you lose energy half C VDD square, okay? And even you discharge it, you lose another half C VDD square. So this is one um, source of power dissipation in today's integrated circuit that it is charging and discharging. Probably you have studied basic CMOS circuit, right? You know, there are three major component of power dissipation, right? Static power dissipation, then dynamic power dissipation and short circuit. So I'm talking about this dynamic power dissipation. So you charge it and when you are charging the capacitor, you are storing information, you lose energy. When you are reading the information, discharge it, you are losing energy, okay? so. Now, in this new type of uh, device that we call resistive memory here, so in capacitor, we store information in charge, right? That is we call vector. So information, you need a physical media to carry the information. Information means say zero and one. But in this type of new kind of memory, we see the information is stored in resistance, not in charge, okay? But actually, I would like to say, you'll see this, the actually, what is resistance, we'll see, it is the property of the material, okay? So information is stored in the material property, not in charge, okay? That is a big change, okay? And so, uh, it is actually, you will see this kind of memory, so it is two terminal, so basic architecture is that you have two terminal, two electrodes, and in between you put something, okay? And when you apply electric field, this something that is a material, some electrochemical reaction happens and that material changes, okay? So material is changing in different way, we'll see. Okay, and because of this change of material, the resistance changes, and this change, it is non-volatile. What does it mean, non-volatile? So non-volatile means, say, you apply something force, I mean, electric field, to change the state of any system. And then you withdraw this electric field, and it will remain as it is, OK? So DRAM, you know, DRAM or SRAM, they are volatile. So if you switch off your computer, it's gone, OK? but the you know your memory stick that is also another type of memory that is called non-volatile that is the flash memory so that's why you can carry you can write something a movie or something document in your um, uh, in your pen drive and then you can just carry it so those are non-volatile even you are not connected to electricity the information will be there 
Okay, so this is the volatile and non-volatile. Now, depending on what you have in between uh, two, two electrodes and the type of electrochemical reaction, this resistive memory could be divided mainly in four components, okay, four different technology and many things are coming up. One is simply resistive memory. I will explain, okay, our emphasis will be on the first one. Second is that phase change memory, PCM, they call it, okay, so that the material is there. You will see if you study material, same material could exist, I mean, for example, in two-dimensional material MO is two, so the naturally occurring phase is hexagonal H, but I mean, same, the formula unit, it will remain, the symbol remains same, MO is two, but the atomic structure could be different, so it has T phase, okay, H phase, naturally occurring MOS2, we'll talk about MOS2, it is semiconducting in nature, but there are other phase like T phase, okay, just the sulfur, the, their, their position will change and it will become T phase or T dash phase, okay, those phases are metallic in nature. So by application of something, some external force, force, if you can change the phase, so it can move from semiconducting to metallic. And so the, I mean, imagine, I mean, within two terminal, if you have a mat material is there, which is normally semiconducting, if you apply electric field and you convert it to metal, then it will be initially open circuit, then it will be closed circuit. So resistance is changing, okay. So then you have the magnetic ram, okay. So it works on the different principle, Okay, so you have two uh, ferromagnetic material and in between you have an insulator. So it depends on the alignment of the spin of the top ferromagnetic material and bottom ferromagnetic material. If the spin is aligned, then the, it will offer a low resistive part if the spins are not aligned. Okay, and parallel and anti-parallel, we say it will um, offer you very high resistance. Okay, so two different discrete resistance points. Then similarly, you have the ferroelectric ramp. Okay, so there are different technology. Okay, but the technology which is really near to commercialization is magnetic memory and the resistive memory. Okay. So now we move on and see more about it. Now here you have to understand this is, so it is not about device and technology, but it is all together a different computing paradigm because there is no capacitance. So it is a resistance based memory. And so many people say it is an analog memory, not really a digital memory. Uh, for example, uh, if you think about our analog circuit and digital circuit, uh, CMOS based, and what is the major difference is that um, if you think about circuit, and so when it is a digital circuit, so we talk about zero and one, and so we use the MOSFET as a switch, right? You turn it off and turn it off, on, okay, on and off. So it is zero or one. But when the same MOSFET you use as a amplifier, okay, it's a common source amplifier, differential amplifier. So there actually each transistor, you basically bias it to some value and then you use it rather as a resistance, right? You put the small signal and see how the resistance is changing because you have resistances related to the transconductance, GM, and then your gain is what your gm multiplied by the load okay so that is the gain you talk about gain in analog circuit so here in analog circuit you use um, a mos transistor as a register whose resistance could be modulated by small signal so that is the major difference between digital and analog okay so similarly here so we are moving out from this capacitance space um storage that is zero and one we are using a register okay so it is analog so it is altogether a new paradigm of computer the logic the usual simple uh if you think about uh, and gate nor gate okay the way you have designed okay why or not gate you can okay what is not gate you have a pmos and in most they are in series that is the not gate okay but the same topology we cannot use here because the device itself is different and this is not a charge-based logic. Okay, so how to develop 
our usual uh, digital logic circuit starting from NOT gate to AND gate, NOT gate, etc. Okay, this is the building block. Okay, so you can go through this paper, they explain it. <coughs> so it is from the circuit or the architecture level. So once you have the circuit, then from the circuit, you make the bigger architecture. Okay. So these are few references I'm throwing, and if you are interested, uh, later phase you can go through it. Right. And uh, then uh, we have uh, so uh, this book uh, I have just bought it, and it is a very nice book. So people who are interested in registry memory was invented by uh, Professor Chua. Okay, long time back he first proposed it. Then uh, the HP they first demonstrated such thing could exist. And it is a very textbook kind of book. Um, even undergraduates can read it. Okay, about the circuit technique. Okay, how to design circuit, how to design logic, and how to design the digital architecture. Fine. So this is for the further reading. Now we come to there are four types I have told you. We just concentrate on the first one that is the resistive memory. Okay, so now this is the typical characteristics of a resistive memory, all kind of resistive memory, or you can say this is the typical characteristics of a mem register. So it has so called this pinch hysteresis loop. Okay, so if you just concentrate on this red line, so this is a typical register, right? So here, if you increase the voltage, the current will increase. So, but how the resistive memory is different? that you increase the voltage current is increasing but very slowly so this is the high resistance state then when you overcome a particular threshold value the current simply jumps to another level okay so this is called low resistance state okay so i mean we in a circuit we put some compliance value and set the limit of the this low resistance current and so now if you pull it back you decrease the um, uh, voltage so it will not come back to this path but it will remain here then when the voltage is close to zero of course the current will be zero okay then if you go to the negative direction see it will again go to that low resistance state and you keep on increasing the negative value then after some time okay at high negative value it will fall back okay we call it resetting the device then again it will follow this part so it has this kind of pinch hysteresis loop and you have clearly two different um uh, discrete level of resistance okay so it is a register but it has a memory inside okay because when you are switching off the device then you switch it on you will not be even you go to the negative voltage you will not be in this high resistive state but you will go to low i mean before switching off the state it can memorize and when you switch it on it will go to the that state only it will not go to the other state okay so this is the memory which is embedded within the resistance so that's why we call it resistive memory or loosely also mem register okay now come to the technology okay we limit ourselves only to the resistive memory technology okay so generally as i told you it has i have shown it from the side so this is the reference you can see it so there would be two electrodes electrodes are made up on metal okay and in between two electrodes you have amorphous oxide so this is the bulk memory star or bulk material based resistive memory okay so how does it happen what is the physics okay i am trying to explain it so when you apply electric field then what happens this atoms at this um, electrode they start moving okay along the direction of the electric field and they form like your hair growth okay they form a filament and it keeps on growing and then they touch the other electrode so uh, i mean when the filament is not there you can understand it is a capacitor so it will offer a very high resistance but when you have the filament and it joins this to end so it will offer a low resistive path okay so here is one paper um uh, so where is this uh, 
I had a video here. Ah, okay. So this is NATCOM. So here it shows how Yeah, you can see real growth of filament. Okay, so electric field is applied, and so it is video web stream. So you can see the you know growth of filament. Okay, it is growing, so it is similar to this process. You can see the you know observation of conducting filament growth in nano. So this is called the filament growth technique. Okay. So this is one way and there is another physics which is we call it valency change memory. So here what happens see this is also an electrochemical reaction okay it is you can say it is one kind of electro migration metal migration okay with the electric field the metal atom they are migrating okay and here what happened we call it is a redox reaction it happens within this uh, oxide and then it creates the oxide vacancy okay this oxide vacancy it has some charge okay it is not uh, insulating it has charge so this oxide vacancy again similar to this it creates a kind of filament and a bridge between we call it also conductive bridge memory so i mean it creates some conductive path between these two electrodes and it helps to go to the LHS that is the low resistive state okay but note that it doesn't matter it is either electrochemical metallization or it is a redox reaction there is some chemical reaction is going on okay and now so this is the technology and it is near commercialization so here we call it it is the oxide based technology okay so you have two electron metal electron and in between you have oxide generally we use titanium oxide then silicon oxide also many type of oxide okay and for this um, uh, electrode people use nickel copper etc now there is a um, certain disadvantage uh, first is that you need this is called forming voltage okay the voltage required to make this um, uh, bridge okay conducting bridge so it requires large voltage before this uh, electrochemical reaction to happen either it is redox reaction or metallization okay and another thing is that the, the geometry scaling how thin you can make because you have to you know you have a bulk oxide so if you scale it down there is a limit of this uh, distance between these two electrodes okay and here so we talk about this 2d material so here what we do that in between this uh, electrode we simply keep the 2d material and it actually gives you the ultimate thin uh, resistive memory okay now another thing is that um, uh, so you understand this is one important thing as, as i am telling this thing again and again how it is different from your ordinary dram which is based on capacitor so they are you simply charge the capacitor okay so information is stored in from of charge okay but here the information is stored inside a material chemistry so when you apply a voltage a chemical reaction is going on electrochemical reaction rather and so any electrochemical reaction there would be some amount of non-predictability okay unpredictability and so this kind of memory uh, it is very much uh, stochastic in nature okay although you have two level of resistance uh, but you cannot say it is one ohm and 10 ohm it could be one ohm and say 12 ohm or it could be nine ohm so there would be some stochastic nature because it is a chemical reaction is going on of this two state okay so it is a problem in circuit design it never happens um, in a capacitor charging right if you have a voltage v a register a capacitor always you how many times charge discharge okay it will be charged to a voltage v okay if your source voltage your battery is v 
So this kind of uncertainty, stochastic ness is not there in charge-based biology because there is no chemical reaction is happening. But since this kind of memory is based on electrochemical reaction, so it is stochastic in nature. And when you are developing your logic circuit, uh, you have to take into account the stochastic nature and there are many techniques, okay? So here again, I have give you some reference, but this is something you have to keep it in mind that this type of memory is stochastic in nature. So when you develop circuit or even architecture based on it, you have to take into account it some other way. Okay. Okay. So let us move on towards commercialization. So there are companies which are coming up starting from, um, you know, uh, uh, some startup uh, to, you know, big companies, uh, Henix with HP in collaboration. So in very near future, we'll be seeing this kind of product available in the market, which will help us to do uh, very efficient uh, in, in memory computing or neuromorphic computing. Okay. Now here we come, uh, go to our main topic, 2D material based resistive memory devices. Okay. So the idea is that again, the two electrode will be there, but inside this amorphous oxide, okay, we just remove it and put a 2D material, okay. Then what it happens? So first it was demonstrated by this group in 2015, okay. But it was a lateral, we call this device MIM, okay. All resistive memory are MIM, metal insulator metal, okay. And um, uh, so they put, you know, a lateral, this is a lateral device. So this is um, one on a substrate. Okay. This is uh, one uh, electrode, another electrode, and this is a 2D material, or you have a 2D material, you just put two electrode at the end. Okay. And then they demonstrated, you can see this, you know, um, uh, bipolar uh, nature of this resistive switching that I have explained. There is two two level of resistance still. So this was the first demonstration of 2D material based resistive memory. Okay. And uh, this is something called uh, M bipolar switching. I will explain it later, bipolar and N bipolar switching. Okay. And um, uh, or bipolar or uh, sorry, bipolar is M bipolar. So it is bipolar or unipolar switching. Okay. So um, uh, this was the first demonstration. Then uh, see if you make the device in this way, you are not taking the advantage of the 2D material, which we say it doesn't have thickness or thickness, it is atomically thin. Okay. So in order to take advantage, of this uh, 2D material, you have to build the device vertically, not laterally. So first demonstration, it was in 2016. They made the device again with MOS2, most commonly used 2D material, okay, silver, MOS2 silver, and they demonstrated this, you know, this bipolar nature of this resistance behaviors with the pinch hysteresis loop, okay. So it is a memory inside a resistance, okay. It is simply stacking up you know, silver, MOS2 and silver, okay. Then several, several groups, uh, they, they demonstrated. I mean, in last five years, there is, you know, starting from, okay, it is six years now. You will see plenty of papers. Uh, they are focusing because memory is a big market. This is an emerging area in memory computing. And uh, so there is a lot of interest from semiconductor industry to develop a very efficient and 2D material is also a very attractive area. A lot of people are working and it is not very difficult to, you know, stack up this kind of uh, material and do some basic measurement. Okay. So what is difficult is actually, you know, uh, to show the yield, high yield and making it really a crossbar structure. Okay. Those are, it requires, you know, material growth and other sophisticated technique. Okay. Uh, so you will see in last six years, five years, a lot of papers uh, are in this particular topic. Okay. So there are plenty, but I am highlighting only the the most important one, okay. 
Then what happened? That is the remarkable thing. It was demonstrated. This UT Austin professor um, Deji Akin one day. So now the eventually question comes that silver, you have two electrode and you have 2D materials. Okay, so how many layer of material you can put? What is the critical thickness? So what they have demonstrated here, it is the ultimate MIM device based on not really ultimate. I will show you what is the ultimate one. So just a single MOS2 layer, which is sandwiched between two metal electrode and it demonstrate the similar, you know, pinch hysteresis look, okay. This was really remarkable because you might think that it is just a mono layer. So this device, it would be extremely leaky, right? And it will not show, I mean, it is the leakage current, it will dominate and it will not show any kind of, you know, hysteresis, okay. But they have, I will discuss our, work will be on the device i will discuss more but that is something that they demonstrated and here i explain another thing you know resetting the device okay so you understand you increase the positive voltage and it moves to the another set another state and then if you bring it back to zero okay then okay so the then again you apply positive voltage or negative voltage it will go to this low resistive state so we would like to reset it we how to bring the low resistive state to high resistive state from here to here so you apply the negative voltage okay negative voltage at certain critical negative voltage you move that is this reset state okay you come back to the high resistive state but it is also possible that you can reset it applying a very small positive voltage see what is happening here so here you go usually here is the state set okay you move from low a high resistive state to the low resistive state you bring it back to zero then if you apply a very high current okay even it is positive okay very high current then you can reset the device even applying a positive voltage okay so here these are bipolar okay positive and negative side so these are called bipolar device but these are the unipolar device okay so some device show both the bipolar and the unipolar nature <coughs> then there is device again you see the difference it was mos2 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 now new material hbn okay you know this is <coughs> a insulator right with a high band gap so it is nature electronics so uh, he is our collaborator professor mario lanja we have a bricks bricks project with him so we are also working in this devices so he first de demonstrated two things one is hbn based device okay you can see similar type of hysteresis look but another thing you see here you see the multiple state okay so this is something we call it um uh, a term used in uh, neuromorphic computing it is called synaptic plasticity okay so every time you access the device the conductivity increases okay uh, so it is like you know you remember uh, our old days in school uh, almost all of us probably disliked history but we have to uh, pass the exam so we have to memorize it and then vomit it during examination so how this memorization happens so you read it multiple times read it read it okay or you know people who are in sports okay they practice it that is also one kind of you do the same thing again and again again and again okay then you expertise that skill okay so that crudely known as synaptic plasticity something you are doing it again and again again and again so in in our head that this complex neural networks so that particular path particular link it gets strengthened in electronically how we say that say there is a resistance and every time i access it okay its conductivity increases or resistivity decreases okay so this is called synaptic plasticity and again in this context few more things the you know neuron architecture that i show at the beginning okay 
uh, that is called uh, the this is the neuron architecture that the computer scientists basically use we call it ANN artificial neural network okay it is actually it is a very simplistic or oversimplified model of the real biological neuron and for that you know uh, we have this kind of thing synaptic plasticity all of this thing cannot be captured in this simplistic ANN architecture. So for that, we have another model called spiking neural model or biological neural model. Okay. So those kind of complex neuromorphic tasks, that is the synaptic plasticity. Okay. So we need this kind of biological neural model. And for that, we need, um, you know, this kind of memory star which demonstrate this kind of complex thing this is one thing but in other way also you can think many of you probably i, I don't know you are aware about something called multiple valued logic okay so what is a binary what we use it is a binary logic zero and one but this concept of binary we can extend it zero one binary zero one two or quaternary you zero one two three okay so it also allow you to you know see what we are doing by this technology scaling we are um, increasing our information density right i mean uh, the devices are becoming small and then uh, unit area um, of silicon you can store more information so you are increasing information density by geometry scaling but if you completely change your um, you know computation logic move from binary to binary or quaternary then probably it is possible that uh, without shrinking down the device i can increase the information density okay so again remember these all are analog of memory okay so there is a plenty room of you know innovation and how really you can make this device and that should be performance must beat our existing dram okay so these are few things uh, you need to remember okay so this is another new material hbn so this is again uh, all these are in high-end journal you know high impact journal nature etc and uh, this is natmat it is very recently last year last year it is from pardu they use mot2 okay another material and they demonstrated you know similar type of thing this paper they demonstrate something else i will come to that uh, but you see that uh, we can achieve um, uh, two things that uh, you know our um, uh, our uh, you know the bulk uh, memory star or bulk uh, resistive memory so what you have two electrode and you have a amorphous oxide in between so basically you can replace the amorphous oxide and put a simple 2d material and you can make the whole device you know the vertical scaling you can achieve extreme vertical scaling okay and uh, the choice of material, we see that uh, this kind of resistive switching you can achieve using various type of 2D material. Okay, actually, this particular group, this is another thing, and you can get this kind of complex uh, synaptic plasticity, and uh, you can achieve this kind of um, resistive memory effect just a single layer of 2D material, which is remarkable because you might expect expect that the device would be you know purely leaky okay one uh, layer of 2d material cannot stop the current uh, to flow from one electrode to another electron because it is super ultra thin it is just atomically thin but it is acting okay now um, so here again we come to this one it is the probably the simplest device to study so again i mean you might explain uh, we they call it atomister okay just atomically thin memory star okay so they demonstrated it uh, with mos2 but different type of mos2 probably you know i mean some of you who work experimental work uh, who do experimental work in 2d material most of the time 
unless you have a growth facility, you buy this material. You probably buy it from the other vendor, this 2dsemiconductor.com or HQ Graphene, a small amount of material, they sell it, you know, $500, okay. So these are exfoliated material and you take this material by scotch tape method, you make the device. So they have made this. So people actually, you know, question, I mean, really, I mean, um, it is really possible or not. So they have demonstrated with different type of sample. Uh, like it is exfoliated sample commercially available then actually they grow the material and they are also everywhere and then they show the single crystal because earlier when first time when they demonstrated this device so they gave a justification one question that is uh, the main topic of our talk that why it is working okay uh so that i am talking because it is well understood how a bulk mem disturb work but here you see between two electrode you don't have any amorphous system okay it is a purely crystalline material then how from where uh this uh, this memory effect is coming this is a one open question so many experiment in last five years you can see it okay everybody is making this device it is not very hard to, to do it you put some 2d material in between two electrodes it is showing the this memory effect but uh, nobody is able to explain that from where it is coming uh, because it is very different from um, the bulk of uh, resistive memory device. This is a purely crystalline memory. Crystalline material you have put between two electrodes. And here uh, they, they try to explain that this material has so-called, we have this grain boundary and from this grain boundary, uh, there are defects and it is creating this kind of effect. But here, uh, these are single crystal. There is no grain boundary, okay? And lithography free transfer free method, every different type of sample preparation. And they are showing uh, this kind of resistive effect and memristive effect. And so it just says that probably this is something intrinsic to the 2D material, which we don't know or we don't understand. And it gives, you know, a community and motivation. Now, very few, but people are now trying to understand. There are many, many papers which is demonstrating this effect. That is fine. But this investigation that why it is happening, okay, this has become a, a puzzle in as a puzzling experiment. Okay. Then you see it has anything to do with electrodes. So they change the electrodes. Okay. Silver from uh, gold to silver it is same most remarkable is that graphene electrode okay both side one side graphene in another group they put both side graphene okay graphene is purely inert material okay you know so purely inert material it is metallic but purely inert material and you have one or few layer of 2d material then from where this memory effect is coming okay this is a big puzzle now we move on and uh, so this is the obscure mechanism of 2d memory stands people are trying to understand again these are very recent paper only last year from the same group what they have done is that it is they call it um, you know uh, have a smallest memory star so it is basically not a device so on this uh, on a gold electrode they have put a single layer mos2 and then there is a stm tip okay and they are doing the measurement and still they are getting memory stress effect okay so instead of so one side you have a conventional electrode but in other side you have unconventional electrode it is a tip stm tip okay and so you can say that this is the smallest possible memory strength because at the tip you will have a single atom okay so here they are trying to give a theory that from the tip uh, first of all one thing you have to understand that most to mos2 what is available in the nature they most of them they are having sulfur vacancy okay that is mos2 one m as you can see here, it is the atomic structure. This blue is um, molybdenum and this purple, they are two sulfur. Okay, so this is MOS2. Actually, this is three layer, you can say. Okay, although it is a single material. 
Okay, so most of the time we find that the sulfur is missing. Okay, so this is called the sulfur sulfur vacancy defect. Okay, and it is quite common in MOS2, and uh, actually it is also found that uh, it is found that sulfur vacancy most of the sulfur vacancy it happens in one plane. Okay, so by plane uh, both plane sulfur vacancy it is actually the chances are less because of the energy calculation. Okay, one side sulfur vacancy, it is giving the lower energy than the both sides sulfur vacancy. So one postulate, we, they have taken some, you know, photographs, though it is not very clear that the, you know, gold atom from this tip, it is coming and settling in, in this vacancy. And so generally when you have a gold atom vacancy, uh, when you have a sulfur atom vacancy and when you bring a gold and it creates a bond here so this area it becomes kind of metallized okay and it creates a, a conductive path between the uh, two electrodes so this is the theory that is the gold atom movement from your electrode okay but there are many but okay because uh, they are showing it with a stm tip okay at the tip you have just a single uh, atom and it will create a very high electric field okay so what is happening at stm tip might not happen you know proper electrode like that and maybe one gold atom is coming and sitting here how it will go back okay and uh, then they are demonstrating only the bipolar characteristics uh, what will happen to the unipolar characteristics and most important is that how you observe such behavior uh, in this graphene type of electrode which is completely passive okay so these questions are still there okay so these are the the mechanism is very much obscure then uh, this group i have told you from Purdue they postulated a different theory with um, you know lot of experiment with measurement characterization tool so they are dealing with mote2 okay and uh, so they first set the device after setting the device they take the device out then peel off the metal layer from the top and then they do the measurement and all the spectroscopy okay then they say you see that some area okay under the uh, electrode this is all h phase mos2 h h but here you can see the this is the atom structure they have changed okay so it has changed from h phase to hd phase okay some you know phase which is close to hd and when they do the density functional theory calculation they find this phase it is more conductive than this h phase okay and even you remove the electric field this phase remain as it is okay so this is one kind of you can claim pcm like phase change memory okay so this was their postulate but then again another group from stanford they came up they did the same experiment with mot2 they really don't believe this theory okay they say it might happen in few cases but it might not be the you know the principal reason so there is some theory there is some um, counter theory okay and uh, so still this is a obscure process i mean we don't know really what it is happening especially when you have to inert electrodes okay like graphene and you put a 2d material inside it is showing this uh, membristive effect and from where it is coming okay and one important point this group has demonstrated that here when the device is in on you have you know this is the heat signature okay so only i mean heat is there where it is conductive so here it is very concentrated regional heat signature okay so heat is there only where this is conducting but the other region the heat is not much okay so it says that the conduction is happening only i mean it is not that the you know whole area under the electrode it is conducting but it conducting is happening only at some 
particular region concentric region on concentric point okay this is very important we have used this thing this observation to develop our model okay now we started working on this thing and recently we have published in this nature journal 2d materials and application so we developed a new theory of uh, non-volatile resistive memory and for here uh, the technique we have used it is called reactive molecular dynamics okay so there are a few unique points in uh, our work that i would like to highlight uh, first of all here we do something called a reactive molecular dynamics okay in india there are many 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 groups are there who works on material groups mainly who works on material and the biological mainly who works on this uh, molecular dynamics okay so now i will give a primer on molecular dynamics to you know a very short introduction to understand who are not aware about molecular dynamics so the difference is that most of the those study i mean they work on this non bonding and coarse grain force field and they mostly work on this biological system so this reactive molecular dynamics in india the community is very small you will hardly find this is very complex okay and especially we apply it to a solid state system to understand uh, you know what is the physics of a particular electronic device okay and here another thing you will see here um, the the molecular dynamics is going uh, hand in hand with density functional theory calculation okay that is also very unique point if you compare our work with any other molecular dynamics work and uh, finally i say as i told you in last five years there is a surge of experimental demonstration of this uh, 2d material based memory star many and many papers i have just highlighted only few which came up in this so-called high impact journal. There are many and many papers, but when you look at the theory, there is almost nothing. Probably this is the first theoretical work which tries to explain, okay, what is going inside the device, okay, some possibility. Now, uh, this is a primer, okay, for molecular dynamics, okay. So what it is, it is a material modeling technique, okay. So what it does, it does, it calculates the trajectory. So you have a system of atoms or system of molecule, whatever, at t equals to zero, you know their position. Then at t greater than zero, what would be their position, provided you have applied some external stimulus or force in terms of temperature, uh, pressure, or even electric field. Okay, so this is a computational framework. Uh, which does only this, the trajectory of these atoms of the molecule over the time. Why it is important? Okay, it is like doing experiment inside a computer and such thing at the atomic level thing you cannot observe by even very sophisticated experiment. And it is heavily being used for different uh, application, material uh, modeling, drug discovery, mainly protein folding, okay biological system very much and um, uh, those kind of ion channels okay always you will find uh, people are using molecular dynamics mostly in biological system okay and uh, so major steps in md this is important to understand okay so how does it work so with time it just calculate the trajectory of this atoms of the molecule so how it works you start with the initial system okay Okay, so these are say uh, t equals to zero. So these are that. Okay, now this is the major thing. Calculate the interatomic force. Okay, so how you calculate it? So we you we calculate it by defining some interatomic potential. Okay, so potential. So it is also called force field. So how you develop this potential, interatomic potential, and this is the most important thing, and the most important ghotala you can say in molecular dynamics. And uh, so actually, it comes from the nature of the interatomic force. There are mainly three kind of force. One is the Coulombic attraction or repulsion, whatever you say. Another is the van der Waal, 
and third is the electron electron repulsion okay so technically speaking the most accurate way to calculate it you solve it physically i mean most accurately by solving the schrodinger and poisson okay but that that is called quantum mechanical ab initio method but the computational budget is very high okay so what we do we use something called classical approach or classical potential also known as force field so when you know this force field using that simple you know take the derivative then you will get the force so you apply the newton's force newton's uh, you know acceleration by newton's equation then you predict the new position okay uh, by time integration here the time step is very important and then you you know iterate over it unless you this the system in a stable condition okay so let us take a look here okay which is the most important part so classical molecular dynamics means this interatomic potential we use some uh, analytical expression okay generally we use the lenard jord potential or lj potential which has this kind of expression attraction and repulsion it is very simple see analytical expression which gives the interatomic um, uh, interaction or potential between two atoms or two element okay so uh, but this is very empirical in nature okay 12 rj okay r all of this thing empirical so you have to fit it with experimental data or ab initio calculation so advantage is that any empirical system it is you know applicable to that particular system um, uh, against which you have fitted it. okay it cannot be so it is not transferable so you have a lg potential for a particular system you cannot apply it to other system so it is not transferable it is not versatile and uh, so another thing it is since it is empirical you don't know when it will fail okay so as long as it is um, it is matching i mean it is matching with your observation it is fine so these are the drawback but the advantage is that it is simple analytical expression so it is very fast computation it can you can do very fast computation so you can do very large very very large system you can go to very high time scale okay and uh, there are available packages lamps uh, and uh, gromax etc okay now the other end it is the ab initio so interatomic potential you can calculate by solving the quantum mechanics okay and there are packages like vas quantum expression okay so they are the advantages is the what are the disadvantages of the classical mechanics it is versatile okay it is ab initio it is applicable for any system but on the other hand the computational budget it is extremely high we can only do simulation only say 100 200 on in hundreds of atom with a very small time scale in picosecond okay which is not a practical time scale at all okay so why you need a bridge you know we have here ab initio and classical so number of atoms is very small number of time scale small and here everything is big big but the accuracy it is more here it is less okay so in what how to bridge the gap okay there are you know two techniques so one is called that is called one why we use this term reactive molecular dynamics here the term reactive is coming that in classical molecular dynamics the interaction between this particle it is either attraction or repulsion okay so it is physical in nature it is not chemical in nature i mean two atom they can they can come together and they can form a bond this cannot be modeled using this lj potential of the classical molecular dynamics okay so that's why we call it is a non bonding force field but that can be captured in ab initio okay so there is the loss of accuracy okay so even they come and you know form a chemical bond this you cannot model it so that information it cannot provide it okay so to handle this situation okay 
so there are few methods the one of the most popular is that using something called reactive force field that i will explain okay so this is also a reactive force field there could be many and this is the react shape which is developed uh, uh it is from penn state group or uh, professor van doing uh, yeah penn state group okay they first develop it and now everybody is using so it has both the reactive and non reactive here you can see so this is the non bonding okay van der waal and coulomb which is already there in lenard george potential this is the new thing they are adding so here the bonding information is there so it can model any chemical reaction that is the most important thing so again advantage disadvantage uh, advantage is that it is much faster than ab initio but on the disadvantage side it is not ab initio it is in between okay so here you have plenty of parameters in lenard jones only you have two parameters here is plenty of parameters and actually you need to fit those parameters okay and uh, the right now there is a tool called scm tools i don't know you are aware about it using this you can develop this reactive force field but we are working on it it is extremely complex and you can look for literature outside their group they are the main developer you will hardly find any people they have developed any new react set okay new reactive force field for any new material okay all the force field they are developed by their their own their group so as a independent researcher if you like to calibrate react set for a new system it is very very complex so these are some uh, you know drawback okay apart from that uh, there is a very new thing it is called machine learning force field okay people are using it okay this is the emerging thing uh you probably know in uh, high performance computing ieee gives a award called gordon bell award every year so this year gordon bell award is given to a group for princeton university uh, for developing deep md that is uh, deep learning based uh, that, that is machine learning force field development okay so this is very important nowadays molecular dynamics and developing uh, reactive force field okay because we understand the, the importance of uh, you know that molecular dynamics uh, method must capture the chemical reaction also not only the physical reaction okay now here is one example again from pardu they use this react shape it is way back in 2015 to model this filament growth in this uh, bulk type of memory star so people have already used this react shape uh, to model uh, for computational modeling of this bulk memory star and uh, we are uh, you know we that gives us motivation that we may use it to understand um, uh, what is happening in 2d um uh, material based memory star okay so we moved to so for us we use for our study we have uh, tried to understand what is going on this atomistry star which is monolayer mos2 based memory star okay to model we have made such kind of atomic model now here there is as i told you that um, react shape feel for all material is not available fortunately it is available for mos2 and uh, you know for any other material like mot2 these are not available and if you would like to work on this material using reactive uh, molecular dynamics you have to develop your own force field that is very complex thing to do fortunately it was available so we started with mos2 based memory star and also it is very simple structure it is relatively easier to model and you have to understand another thing that in order to do this kind of very large scale reactive molecular dynamics sim uh, simulation you need super computer okay fortunately in our isc we have that now you probably aware about nsm under nsm uh, even the small the other 
institute almost all iits and everybody is getting a super computer and even um, uh, even in your institute you might not have super computer but you can uh, write a proposal under nsm recently there was a call for uh, proposal we get one project based on the outcome of this work you can write proposal and you can get money and what is your nearest or even in isc super computer you can log in and you can run your simulation so nsm is like an animation i would say okay and actually this is not free okay you have to pay money to run your simulation in those super computer and so they started this nsm project if you are interested in this kind of work okay please look at nsm website okay so you can apply for when the next call of the proposal will be there okay so now we have uh, designed this device so here uh, another thing is that um, we have this kind of system you have two electrodes so we have done with passive electrodes so initially what we have done so in between electrode and uh, mos2 we have used something called lj okay we call it lj wall lj potential but for mos2 it is the reactive potential okay now so there we have intentionally we have made vacancy so it is the top view and it is the side view okay and uh, where is okay now so here you see the sulfur vacancy so whenever you apply a electric field okay something remarkable thing happens we call it that is the our main theory we call it popping of sulfur okay so here it was at zero electric field and this the electronic structure that is the band structure it is the density of states of a mos2 and you can see it is a semiconductor and here it has the band gap, the usual band gap, which is uh, with uh, GGAPB, you get like 1.5, you can say it is 1.5. And here one, you know, state you can see which is coming because of the, you know, vacancy. Okay, if the state was not there, you will not see this thing. But the state, it is not on the Fermi level. So it is not helping the material uh, to transport, okay so uh, so although there is a state but it is not on the fermi level okay now when you electric field apply it okay so initially we thought that we will see some phase change or something like that but it was unexpected we found this sulfur atom it comes and it gets stuck here at the plane of the molybdenum atom okay it is not going here naturally it is probably supposed to be here okay but it comes and it gets stuck okay then we do a dft of this system okay again you see the density of states and what is new thing you see that this movement of sulfur it creates a state just on top of the fermi level so this creates a conductive region okay then when you do the isosurface so this is the center where the pop-up has happened so it is the electron density web okay it is the electron web we call it isosurface on the fermi level okay it is the electron wave function so it is not i mean you see the distribution of the wave function so it just says that the whole area with a diameter of five angstrom is becoming conductive. Okay, so we give a name, we call it, it is a virtual filament. So you can say that when there is a pop-up, there is a five angstrom radius, okay, around this popped up, it become metallic. And if this is metallic, the other part, it is non-metallic, semiconducting, only this part, something like this it will become metallic and so it is creating a bridge between these two electrodes okay so this is not a real filament but we call it it is a virtual filament okay this is first thing that is the pop-up sulfur atom it creates a, a concentrated it is a metallized zone okay which is you know concentric around the pop sulfur atom so which creates a conductive path so this is one point and second thing is that non-volatile in nature so there is something called bonding analysis we can do 
which says the strength of bond between this atom. It is found that, you know, before popping up and after popping, okay, the bond strength of the sulfur with the neighboring atom, it has increased. Okay, with, you know, we can do calculation. It shows like that. It is before and after. Okay. So, intuitively, you can think like this way that here, sulfur, it was not in symmetric position, but here it is symmetric position. So, it has coordinate, the coordination with the other atom, it has increased. So, it has increased the bond strength. And what is the significance of this? It is the non-volatility of the memory that you have seen earlier in experiment. Now, even I withdraw the electric field, the sulfur atom, because it bonding has increased, it doesn't go back to the original position. So it creates the change of the state of the resistance and still it is non-volatile. Okay. So here there are some more insight. This is called NEB, okay, Nage elastic band. What does it gives you that it was initial position, it is the end position. In order to move from the initial position to end position for this sulfur atom, what is the energy barrier it has to face? So when it wants to move from here to here, it can see an energy barrier. Okay, that's why normally it is at set state. But if I keep on the electric field, you see the energy barrier is reducing. So it is helping the sulfur atom to move to here to here. But if you see the opposite one, it was here and it wants to come back. You see the height of the energy barrier, this side, okay, or this side, the opposite way I have drawn, it is much higher than the other way. So it explains that is the, you know, the irreversibility of the process or the non-volatile nature that even you withdraw the electric field, it doesn't come back. Okay. And when you are in the reverse position, even you increase the electric field, okay, the barrier decrease, it is very minimal. It is not like that, that here it was a barrier and it come back to zero. Okay. So these are the major understanding that is the popping up sulfur atom and how it is creating non-volatile memory effect. Okay. Now I have very small time, I guess. So we conducted you know, this type of experiment. So we applied electric field like a sinusoidal, okay. And we made many defects and we see how many sulfur atoms they are popping up, okay. And here exactly we see that the kind of hysteresis effect you can see here, what you see in the experiment, okay. So now take it, the return, what we have done, we, in, we increase the regional temperature. As I told you, okay, in the experiment, it was observed that there is a regional heat dissipation because of the, you know, not the all part of the um, uh, piece of semiconductor, it is conducting only the few points, only the region, okay, and there the temperature is very high. So that is the way we have modeled it. And then only we can make the atom returns okay and in this process i can show you uh, the video see this is the popping up here so at bit so this is the sulfur popped up okay and now it has already popped up it will go back So it has gone. So this kind of, as I told you, that molecular dynamics gives, it is the trajectory. Now I quickly finish that with this, this theory, <laughs> we can explain both the bipolar and unipolar. Unipolar, you see the negative direction, I am not going, but I am, I can bring back the sulfur atom. Okay. Then initially we did it with LJ wall, then we put the explicit graphene electrode. Still we see that you know, this happening, it is, you know, it is popping up and coming back. Okay. And we see this memory strip effect. And although we tried with explicit gold electrode, but here we see that the same thing is happening, but uh, people are postulating that the gold atom probably will come and sit here. 
we see there is some movement of the gold atom but it is not coming and sit here because here we don't have the reaction fold field between the gold and mos2 so here also we have used the lj and that is the thing i'm trying to say using this commonly used lj you cannot do this kind of you cannot do the modeling of this kind of phenomena okay so we need to develop reacts model or reactive force field model between the gold and the mos2 okay so now it is the summary that uh, what uh, this in memory computing it is a very emerging field that is very interesting and the work is going on as you can see starting from material to device to circuit to architecture and we are working um, on this 2d material based memory store actually we are trying to understand how these devices are working there is very little work there are plenty of work which is demonstrating this behavior that is the uh, history is loop okay but there is very little which gives the insight using the molecular dynamics we are trying to understand it and for monolayer mos2 we have observed this novel phenomena called sulfur popping which can explain both the you know Uh, most of the observation made in the experiment especially both the bipolar and the unipolar behavior okay okay and thank you so i can take a few more question if you have time so thank you very much for a wonderful talk on uh, memories using 2d materials and uh, uh, giving very wide overview about different uh, materials which have been used for making these types of uh, memory devices and uh, coming to the uh, computational part so thank you very much and uh, participants can ask questions through q and a section sir you can see q and a where uh, if you bring your cursor top upside there will be drop down uh, menu okay i click q and a yeah yeah q and a okay Did you find it? Yes, uh, there is one question: How to identify which is analog and digital memory, which is the best unipolar and bipolar device, and why? Um, see the first question. I don't know how to answer because uh, all the existing these are two different uh, topology altogether. and how to identify because you know by design it is digital memory or analog memory i mean all the memory presently we are using these are digital memory and uh, these are the futuristic memory it would be probably analog memory so if you design the memory using this nvram so we can say it would be a analog in nature it is like that and second question which is best unipolar and bipolar again it depends on the application i mean say if you don't have any source for a negative bias then probably unipolar device would be better but uh, not all device will show both the unipolar or bipolar nature Yeah, I don't have any other question. I I don't see. It. Okay, uh, that is another question, uh, sir. It is a general doubt. Could you please explain what is meant by Monte Carlo simulation, and what kind of situation? Uh, we have not discussed any Monte Carlo simulation here, uh, but it is also another method of calculating uh, trajectory. uh but there is i mean people also use monte carlo method here you can go for very long time scale but monte carlo method using that you can solve many other problems also not related to material um like uh, simple you probably know monte carlo method using you can calculate uh, you know the value of pi 22 by 7 Okay, it based on some random number generation. So Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics are two different thing. It is not related. What is the mechanism of current flow in MEM register in nano letter? Okay, that is the thing. Uh, it is still not well understood, and uh, we are trying to give a explanation. Okay, that is everybody is looking for answer. but from the same group what they are saying that uh, you know the when the electrodes are made of 
say gold some gold particle can be you know migrate from the electrode and sit inside the vacancy position and that's how the current flow from one electrode to another electrode okay but it doesn't explain all the thing is it tunneling oh in that sense yeah it is all tunneling yeah of course because it is not over the barrier it is through the barrier actually i cannot say it is tunneling or not see what is happening it is not tunneling i would say because of, uh, the material itself is getting changed tunneling means you have you know two say for example two electrodes and in between some semiconductor and you are tunneling through the band okay conduction and valence band but here either it is a metal ion migration or the theory like sulfur movement so you are changing that particular region from um, insulator to metal okay so it is a continuous conductive path so you cannot say it is a tunneling okay okay i don't see anything yeah yeah i think uh, there is no more question so uh, let me thank you sir again okay, for uh, joining us for this uh, nano dev and uh, presenting about your recent work on non materials thank you very much sir for joining us okay thank you thank you thank you